This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. Go to the link in the description below so they know that I sent you. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone and it is Saturday and from now on that means it's time for an installment of a new-ish video series, The History of the Band and Restricted List. A series that looks back at the game's numerous banned and restricted announcements and talks about what got those particular cards banned and restricted. I say new-ish because you may remember me doing some videos on this topic back in 2017 over on the Etherhub, a channel that I used to contribute content to. I considered starting where I left off with that series, but when I went back to look at those videos, I realized that my video making ability has improved drastically in the last couple of years, and as a result I decided to start over. So today, we're looking at the game's very first banned and restricted announcement, which came down on January 25th, 1994. This was five months after the game debuted in August of 1993, and it was the first step Wizards took toward managing the game and creating a fair competitive environment with an eye towards having official competitive tournaments. The first announcement only includes cards from Magic's first two sets. The first of these appeared in three printings, commonly called Alpha, Beta, and Unlimited. In December of 1994, Magic's first expansion was released called Arabian Nights. Some of the cards for that set were in the announcement too. This very first announcement restricted 19 cards. If a card is restricted, a player can only include one copy of that card in their deck. The announcement also banned one specific card and all the anti-cards. More on what those are later. A banned card can't be played in any number. Something important to note about this first announcement is that it is not format specific. This is because all there was at the time was magic. There were really only two sets out. As we progress throughout this series, we'll see the new formats developing. But for this first edition of the series, we're just talking about magic because that's all there was. Now, let's start with the cards that were restricted in this announcement. Let's start with the most obvious restrictions that were made. The Power Nine, a group of cards so-called because they were considered the strongest cards in the game. Up to this point, people could play four copies of the fabled Power Nine, and Wizards realized pretty quickly that this was a problem. The majority of this video won't focus on the restricting of the Power Nine, mostly because the reason they were restricted is obvious to us today. But to put it briefly, the Moxen and Black Lotus gave players access to absurd amounts of mana very quickly, and if players could run as many of those as they wanted, games would be over in a hurry. Then there are the three blue cards of the Power Nine. Ancestral Recall allowed you to draw way too many cards for one mana. Time Walk gave you an extra turn for too little mana. Meanwhile, Time Twister lets you completely reload your hand with seven cards, while also shuffling your Time Walks and other cards back into your library. So maybe your opponent never even gets a turn. So yeah, these cards were busted, and we can see why. But part of what is fun about these videos is to talk about the cards that got banned that seem somewhat strange to us today. Something that is a reflection of a number of things. Power creep in the game, and a need for greater context to understand the decisions to ban or restrict those cards. In addition to the Power 9, there were two other cards restricted that would probably make the cut for a Power 11 if we ever went there, and that's Soul Ring and Time Vault. Soul Ring, like a Mox, allowed people way too much mana way too early, and Time Vault, like Time Walk, was way too easy of a way to give yourself extra turns. In addition to the Power 9, Soul Ring, and Time Vault, eight other cards were restricted with this announcement. Let's go through each of them and talk about why they got restricted. Let's start with Ali from Cairo, which I think is one of the stranger ones to get restricted, at least to us today. He had only just been printed a month before the restrictions were announced, so there hadn't been a ton of time to see if he would actually be good. Certainly, by today's standards, he wouldn't be. A 4-mana 0-1 that keeps you from dying to damage wouldn't be playable in a constructed format today. It's just too vulnerable. But Wizards was concerned that Ollie basically broke one of the central rules of the game and regretted printing a card that had such an effect. At the time, there was sort of a feeling that you couldn't just expect a deck to have a removal spell in it, and if a deck didn't have one, it just couldn't beat Ollie from Cairo, and they didn't think that seemed fair. However, after its restriction, Ollie saw no play as a one-of, even though that was legal, and he would not be restricted for very long. He would come off of the list in 1996. He has never seen play in a competitive deck in any format. Basically, I think the restriction of Ollie from Cairo was a reflection of the early days of the game, where they didn't want to make it sort of a requirement that people had to play removal spells, but the way things shook out anyway, people needed to play removal spells to win games anyway, and a card like Ollie from Cairo wasn't all that scary in a format where everyone is playing removal spells. 
Next, we will look at Berserk, a card whose restriction makes a lot more sense than Ali's. This is the kind of card that, if it were ever printed in a standard legal set today, I could see it being played. So, for one green mana, it doubles the power of a creature and gives it Trample. The effect here isn't too dissimilar from something like Team or Battle Rage, which sees a lot of play in modern right now. This card could represent a boatload of damage in a hurry, and a lot of the announcements on this list, like the Power 9, were restricted to make the games last longer. If Tournament Magic became a thing and all the games were over by turn 2 or 3, that would be a problem. Berserk is a card that could win games out of nowhere, especially in multiples. Unlike Ali, Berserk was played as a one-of in Magic's early days, with it appearing in one of the top 8 decks from Magic's first professional tournament, Worlds, in 1994. It was played in a zoo aggro deck that could use the card to do massive amounts of damage. Berserk remained restricted for a long time, all the way until 2003, when it was finally removed from the list in Vintage and Legacy. Since then, it has found some success in Infect decks that can win the game quickly with a card like Berserk. This announcement also restricted Brain Geyser. This is a card, like Ali, that doesn't seem overly impressive by today's standards. Two blue and X to make someone draw X cards at sorcery speed isn't all that impressive. I mean, look at something like Sphinx's Revelation. However, it was restricted for similar reasons to Ancestral Recall. Obviously, Recall is far more powerful, but in a world of fast mana, Brain Geyser could generate some pretty absurd early card advantage too. It is worth noting, you could also use it to mill your opponent out, but there weren't actually that many ways to produce infinite mana at this point in Magic, though that would become a problem later. However, I think it may have been a bit of overkill after restricting the power 9. Nobody played this as a one-of copy, something they would have done if it were powerful enough, like they would do with Ancestral Recall. And once it got unrestricted in 1998 and extended, which was actually an unbanning, and in 2004, when it was unrestricted in Vintage, nobody played it then either. Dingus Egg is another sort of strange card to get restricted. Again, this is a card that today would probably not be played at all. A 4-mana artifact that damages players every time a land is destroyed, including your own, is not so good. Wizards restricted this one out of concern for the fact it could combo with Armageddon. Decks playing Armageddon were usually faster aggro decks that could establish a board presence early and then use Armageddon before slower decks could establish themselves on the board. If Dingus Egg was in play, the aggro player would have no problem winning as they would make their opponent unable to cast very much and do a bunch of damage to them at the same time. Meanwhile, they would still have a creature or creatures in play ready to go after the rest of their life. However, Wizards seems to have realized that restricting this was unnecessary. It was unrestricted four months later, in May of 1994, and it has never managed any real success in any competitive format. Gauntlet of Might was also restricted in January of 1994. So, after blue, red was the color with the most cards restricted in this announcement. In general, it seems there was some concern about the power level of red, and Gauntlet of Might's inclusion on the restricted list is a result of that. The fact that it could also lead to huge amounts of mana relatively early was also a concern. This card is of course quite powerful. Pumping your whole board and increasing your red mana is quite nice. However, like Dinga said, Gauntlet of Might had only a brief stay on the restricted list and became unrestricted in May of 1994. Also, like Dinga said, Gauntlet of Might never found a home in competitive magic, further illustrating that the card probably didn't need to be on the list to begin with. Next, let's look at a card that we're probably familiar with thanks to countless reprints, and that's Icy Manipulator. A card that, while excellent in limited formats even today, isn't exactly the kind of card that people get upset about being in standard. The restriction of Icy Manipulator, though, has to do with the game operating under some different rules in the early days. If an artifact got tapped, it meant that the artifact couldn't do anything. In other words, if you tap down an opposing artifact, the card essentially became blank, being turned off by the manipulator. What's more is, Icy Manipulator was colorless and could be played in any deck. In the end though, even with that difference in rules that made the Manipulator better than it is today, Icy Manipulator spent even less time on the restricted list than Dingus Egg or Gauntlet of Might, being unrestricted in March of 1994. Kind of funny it spent less time on the list because Icy Manipulator has actually done some work in competitive magic, finding success at events between 1994 and 1998 pretty consistently. Still, it was probably the right call to unrestrict it. While undoubtedly a good card, it isn't completely unfair or anything. Orcish Oriflam was also restricted in January of 1994, and it may be the weirdest of the cards to make this list. Oriflam wasn't really restricted for power level reasons alone. I mean, a 4 mana enchantment that gives plus 1 plus 0 to all of your attacking creatures is nothing special. Instead, it was restricted because of a mistake in the original printing of the card. Back in the day, there was no Gatherer, so there was no easy way to errata a card that had a mistake. While Orcish Oriflam these days is a 4-mana enchantment, it was actually printed at 2-mana when it was printed in Alpha. 
Out of fear that the two-mana version of the card would be too good, especially in multiples, Wizards decided to restrict it and keep any issues emerging from that printing error. Orcish Orphalom would be unrestricted less than a month later, though, and it would go on to have absolutely no appearance in competitive Magic decks. This brings us to our last of the cards that were restricted on January 25th, 1994, and that's Rook Egg. Rook Egg is one of my favorite Magic cards in general. It is interesting and flavorful, being an egg that hatches into a huge bird when it dies. Sort of like Orcish Oriflamme, a mistake on the card is what led to this restriction. Here, it wasn't that the mana cost was printed incorrectly, it was that the card was far too vague about how it worked. The gatherer text for the card today says it has to die, but the way it is worded here, it only says if Rook Egg goes to the graveyard. This means that there were people who built decks where they just planned on holding on to more than the maximum number of cards and discard a Rook Egg and get a 4-4 flyer for no mana. In those early days, instead of wizards stepping in and saying that the card only works when the creature goes to the graveyard from play as they intended, they just restricted the card to keep it from being abused too much. Like the Oriflamme, it was unbanned a month later, at which point wizards did simply decide to have an official ruling about the card and explain how it was supposed to work. Also, like the Oriflamme, it would go on to do absolutely nothing in competitive magic. All right, so those are the cards that were restricted in January of 1994. Now, let's move on to the cards that were banned. As I mentioned earlier, there is one specific card that was banned we'll look at, as well as an entire category of cards. Let's start with the individual card, especially because it's a pretty infamous one. It is, of course, Shaharazad. Yeah, that's a confusing block of text. Basically, what this does is it makes you leave the board state as it is and start another game of magic with what's left of your deck. Then you play that whole game and whoever loses it loses half of their life in the main game. You know, there's a reason this made my list of most confusing cards because it is incredibly confusing. This didn't get restricted because anybody thought it was too good. It got restricted because it made games of magic miserable. We talked earlier about how they didn't want games to be too fast but they didn't want them to be incredibly slow either, and that's what Shaharazad did. It made games go for an incredibly long time, and they just wanted to make sure that no one who was watching competitive magic would see this nonsense and swear off of the game forever, which was a real possibility. Shaharazad remained banned for a long time, but would actually be unbanned in Vintage and Legacy in 1999, only to be banned all over again for the exact same reasons it was banned before in 2007. Wizards probably hoped that people just wouldn't play the card because it wasn't very good, but they underestimated the fact that there are trolls in the world that will show up to their local game store legacy tournaments and play this card, ruining fun for everybody. So the card was banned again, and it remains banned to this day. Now, to wrap up our discussion of this first ban and restricted announcement, let's talk about an entire category of cards that was banned in this first announcement, and those are anti-cards. So, when Magic was originally envisioned by Richard Garfield, the game would be played with what is called an anti. A random card in both decks would be put into an anti-zone. Whoever won the game would get both cards. In other words, if you lost a game of Magic, you not only had to deal with losing, you also physically lost one of your cards. There were nine cards designed that could interact with this anti-zone, like Jeweled Bird here. However, this proved to be unpopular, and in the end, anti was removed from the game for three main reasons. The first was just its unpopularity. This essentially meant you had to pay something to play a game of Magic in a way, and losing cards was a great way to feel really bad. Imagine losing your favorite card. The second reason was that this element made Magic a little bit too close to gambling, and this was a problem for legal reasons. If the game came to be considered gambling, a lot more regulation would have to be involved with organized play, and you also have to think about public relations. Parents wouldn't want their kids playing a game that involved gambling. And finally, if Wizards really wanted to create a competitive environment, and indeed they did, the first Worlds tournament ever would happen at the end of the year in 1994, Having this be part of it was not a way that made any sort of sense. Imagine registering your deck list, losing a card, and then having to find another copy of it. So in the end, they decided to completely scrub anti-effects from the game. Today, in Vintage, a set that has famously almost no banned cards, Shaharazad and the anti-cards are the only cards that are straight up banned, and everything else is restricted. But it goes to show you how both Shaharazad and anti-cards are viewed as being just not part of the game the way Magic should be played anymore, because everything else is legal in Vintage except for them. Well, that does it for this first episode of the History of the Banned and Restricted list. I'll be back next Saturday to continue to talk about ban and restricted announcements in 1994, specifically looking at those that came down in March and May of that year. If you want to make sure you catch that next episode of the series, don't forget to subscribe. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. Thanks for watching.